Good morning, everybody. My name is Keith Byram, and today I'm working with Somerset Baptist Church on a project to create Bible study and Sunday school programs for people who can't be at church because of the virus or for whatever reason, and that they can see these on YouTube uh, on the internet. So, last week we talked about Genesis 1 and we talked about uh, the fact that uh, the fact that God created the heaven and earth. He began it with in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. So we know that uh, it couldn't have been any other way. It couldn't have been God and Muhammad or God in a, in a rock, Baal. God created everything. We also know from the Bible, from Genesis, that the animals and plants were made in six days. And then, by the way, there were six 24-hour days so that there's no confusion here. He's not offering any uh, confusion that it took two and a half million years to, to uh, make the earth. He tells us it was made in six 24 hour days. Also that he made the animals and plants fully grown. So he made a tree and he put it down, Holy Spirit put it down. And the trees and all animals have seeds of their own kind. So a cow can't have a dog. A cow can have a cow. And that was purposeful as he was trying to cover the earth with the animals that man made. Uh, thirdly, uh, the Bible tells us he rested on the seventh day. He did so as an example to us. And how many of us have had to work seven days a week for extended time? We need rest. It was so important that God put it in the first chapter of the Bible. Now, we also discussed that God wanted us to understand his commands and he spoke them into the Bible. These are God's words in this Bible. Some man may have written them down but God spoke them. And if they're in this Bible, they are true. And we cannot go back into the Bible and say, well, I don't really like that rule, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna believe it. The same is true with the creation. The creation is true. If we believe in Christ as Lord and Savior, then we have to believe that it's true. Now, we must read the Bible. We must understand what we believe in so that we can go and teach others, particularly our children, but others as well. We must also be able to defend the Bible when it's attacked by outsiders, by people who don't believe in the Bible, or even by scientists. One of the biggest attacks on creation comes from the scientific community in the form of evolution. Evolution theory does not have God 
as part of the theory, and we'll explain why. The evolution theory started with Charles Darwin in 1859, who wrote The Origin of the Species. Now, it was widely read in North America as well as in Europe, and yet it wasn't necessarily accepted as truth, although some people did. But a lot of people thought it was just funny. I mean, how, how does a monkey become a man? Well, that was the theory, is that man evolved from a monkey to a man, and that a fish evolved from amoeba. It all, it all started with amoeba. And so it was kind of a funny idea, and they they often would talk about the missing link. If in fact evolution was true, and man evolved from a monkey, why do we still have monkeys? And if evolution is true, then why can't we find any signs of of a in between any signs of all of this uh, evolution anywhere in the world and we don't uh, evolution uh, began to be accepted in the early 1900s there was a trial in 1925 it was called the scopes trial or the monkey trial, when the state of Tennessee tried to outlaw the teaching of evolution in the schools. It's a famous trial, there was even a movie about it. About it. But the courts decided that evolution was a true science and that uh, our uh, genesis uh, creationism was a religion. And since then, we have been fighting this battle over and over uh, where people believe that evolution is true and is taught in our schools, even though there is no real truth or no real uh, uh, evidence of evolution being true. Since 1968, uh, uh, creation, creation science has not been allowed uh, in our schools unless it's disguised as some overall thing but not religion. But evolution is always taught. Now there are four parts of evolution and it doesn't mean that all, all of them are wrong. But let me quickly go over them. One is variation. And the idea is in evolution that all species differ and produce many variation in physical and mental features. Now, we know that. We know that some people are tall and some are short, some are big, some are small, some are smart and some are others, something other than that. Uh, so there is variation. And we know that our brothers and sisters vary from us, so we know there is variation. Can't, can't really object too much to that one. The second tenet of evolution is genetic transfer. In this one, the idea is that parents transfer genetic traits to their offspring. Well, you know what? We understand that too. This, that's very understandable. We know that people look like their parents, etc. And we also know that on the negative side, children often have the same kind of negative traits that their parents had. Now, sometimes it can be seen even in children who do not grow up with their 
parrot. They have those kind of chains in them. Now, we know that, uh, that, that that's not what God intended. And then there is, the third part is natural selection. Selection based on traits that are selected by nature on a random scale to help them survive. Now, these are traits that are not God-given. But we as Christians believe that God has made all of us the way we are for a purpose, for his divine plan. I'm going to read a couple of uh, verses that, that remind us of that. One is John 1, 4, 47. When Philip is introducing Nathaniel to Jesus. And Jesus said, Before Philip called you, I saw you under the fig tree where he was born. Suggesting that God knew Philip before he was even created. Okay. So, there's another one uh, that kind of suggests that, that the Bible uh, uh, helps us to understand uh, and it is Exodus 34, 7. And the Bible says, God visits the inequity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So when we as fathers sin, what this is saying is when we sin, we do something to ourselves we, in a sense, kind of change our DNA, mentally or physically, and we pass that on. And we see that happen over and over again. Now, that does not mean that if, if uh, my father's bad habits have been passed on to me, there's nothing I can do about it except to have the same bad habits. Because we know from Scripture that when we repent and believe in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, He takes all the old away and gives us a new life with new traits, taking the bad traits away. So that was the third one about the traits and where they come from. We believe they came from God. The evolutionists believe they come from random activity of species trying to survive. The fourth one was time, and this one was a problem for the evolutionists. It was very hard, because how do you explain how much time it takes for an amoeba to become a fish or a monkey to become a man. Well, they solved that problem simply by creating more years. We believe in the Christian Bible, if we count it all up, we're not sure how old it is, but we believe it's somewhere between six and 8,000 years. We're not sure. But in order to do the things that the evolutionist said had to be done in evolution. They, they came up with the, the figure 4.3 billion years. Now what in the world is that? How did they come up with 4.3 billion years? Well, let's look at that. In order to be a theory, I mean a science, 
which they believe they're a science. You have to have witnesses. You have to have proof, which would be geology, or you have to have fossils. Let's look specifically at what they have claimed. First of all, they use something called uranium lead isotope. They first began to uh, look at meteors, thinking they came down many, many years ago, but they couldn't really use the isotopes. They didn't get anything out of that. So they began to look for antiquity artifacts that had uh, carbon in them. And they used a process called carbon-14. Carbon deteriorates over time. And if they would use these isotopes, they could determine how, how much the carbon had deteriorated. And if they could equate that, equate that to number of years, they could tell how old it is. So some things, I mean, they're pretty f fair at finding something that's a thousand or two thousand years, years old. But much beyond that, it gets to the point where there's no more carbon left in the sample. So maybe the carbon could go up to six or seven thousand years, but they can't really even go beyond 10,000. Now, the funny thing about this so-called proof is there's no way to refute it. So they come and tell you that the world is a million years old, five million, whatever it is. They say, we don't have any way to refute that. They don't have any way to prove it either. But they've been able to get by with it because they're thought of as a science. And that's the way they teach it. Let's look at some other things. One of the things they like to do is to go to, to, the, to places like the Grand Canyon and count the number of layers. Problem is, is to get over any uh, number of years that might help them. They'd have to cut out some more ground there's just not that many rings. And many of the rings are bent. And when they saw the bent rings in the Grand Canyon, they began to wonder how that happened. So they built this simulator made of many, many layers of sand that had come on through the Great Flood. The Great Flood would wash layers and layers and layers and build it up and then run the flood through it and it would make something that looked exactly like the great the Grand Canyon. Now I'm not sure how God made the earth. I don't know what Grand Canyon really tells us but I can tell you it doesn't tell us. It doesn't prove evolution. Let's look at the third one, witnesses. How many witnesses do they have on their side? Well, they don't have any. It's not very good. They don't have any. But what about our side? Well, on our side, we have three witnesses. Who are they? God. God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Now, how do we know this? Because each of us who knows God also knows Jesus and also knows the Holy Spirit. Because when we turn our life to over to Jesus and surrender to him, his Lord and Savior, then we know him as well as we know any person. And God provides us with the opportunity for a life that is full 
and good. Well, I'd like to conclude with a story with a few with a few remarks out of Colossians 1.15. And to me, this kind of sums up what we've been talking about. Sorry. Colossians 1, 1 15. It says, He, meaning God, is the image of the invisible God. Oh, Jesus. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth visible and invisible, whether thorns or powers, or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning of the firstborn from among the dead, so that everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have his father's, father's dwell, his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you have alienated from God and were enemies in your minds, but of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ, physical body through death, to present you holy in God's sight without blameless, without blemish, and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, establish and firm, not moved from the hope held in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that you that has been proclaimed in every creature under heaven, and I, which I, Paul, became a servant. Remember that God cannot look upon mortals who are sinful, who are not righteous. He can only look at people like us in righteousness. And the only way we can get that is to surrender to Jesus as our Lord and Savior. If you want to talk to somebody about this, please contact our pastor, myself, one of the deacons, and we can help you understand this. Thank you so much. Good night.